Good afternoon, saints of God. This is Robin Kirbyghetto. Welcome to today. It is a new day in the Lord. Amen. I forgot to put on my earrings, so you get to watch me as I put on my earrings. And isn't it awesome that Holy Spirit has really caused us to circumcise our ears? Amen. Circumcise our ears is what Scripture says in Jeremiah 7. We want those circumcised ears, not just circumcised hearts. But circumcised ears in Jesus name and if one of you will let me know if you can hear me I would be grateful I see you Sharon thank you for joining in but someone let me know if you can hear me because I just want to make sure my audio is coming in God bless you and thank you for joining in I know it's gonna it's a delayed reaction after I speak so I'm just gonna wait a minute and see if you can hear me We've got such an awesome message. Amen. Oh, good, Sharon. Thank you. Thank you so much, sister. Yay, you can hear me. Thank you, Jesus. I just want to make sure it works. And amen, Shirley. We're going to have a great message. Oh, good. Thank you, Patricia. I'm just going to enter into this message of truth with prayer. Amen. God, we just bless your name. We thank you for the work of your mighty hand through Jesus Christ the very Son of God as you love this world so much that you sent your only beloved Son in order to reconcile us to you father we acknowledge the power of the crucifixion as he is the Lamb of God and he brought us into that atonement that right standing in the faith with you father God not in our own righteousness but in Christ Jesus righteousness God and we thank you for that father in Jesus name and we thank you for the power of resurrection and the strength of that power and what it affords to us in your knowledge wisdom and understanding in Jesus name amen hey Joanne Morgan I love you thank you well, I am just super excited, oh my goodness, because first and foremost, I am feeling some breakthrough, I don't know about you, but I am feeling a little breakthrough over the last couple of days, and I'm so super excited about what God is going to be delivering to us today about a massive insight, revelation, truth of scripture for us to understand Jesus Christ as the breaker. Amen. Hey, Dietra, I love you. Hey, Susan, God bless you. And so we're going to get into Micah 2. We're also going to get into other scriptures. And I just want to bring up some things that I did preach about in Missouri, which was a phenomenal meeting. And I want to give a shout out to Amy Harris. Thank you for the invite. Holy Spirit moved so mightily, and it was an awesome way to start out the feast that we have of Passover, amen, and unleavened bread. And one of the things that we look at in this celebration of the feast, hey, Christina, I saw Christina there, and I got to hug her neck and see her precious, young, beautiful princess. Hey, Katie Higgum, thank you for joining in. One of the things that I talked about was the dung gate. We see this in Jerusalem in the book of Nehemiah. And I'm going to get into that scripture. I'm going to get into Ephesians 3. And I'm going to also get into Micah 2. And our focus is going to be on resurrection power. And that inheritance which we have been afforded. Also, when I do Facebook Live... On Friday we will be doing communion so those of you who want to bring the elements with you whether it's juice of the vine and a small token of bread or water if you don't have juice of the vine we're going to do communion to acknowledge in remembrance of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us on Friday amen and understand, before Resurrection Sunday, the enemy was taking advantage of the souls of man, 
that were given over to the teachings of Christ, the disciples, and he was sifting them. We see this in Luke 22 with Simon Peter when Jesus says, Simon, Satan has asked permission to sift all of you like grain, but I've already prayed that when you return, you will what? Strengthen the brethren. Why? Because Peter would not be strengthening the brethren in his own ability. He would be strengthening the brethren in that new anointing, the fresh anointing, Psalm 9210, Isaiah 40, 31, Zechariah 4, where that new anointing from the branch, from Messiah, would pour out upon Simon Peter and that strength of Holy Spirit that Jesus promised to send of the counselor, the advocate. Hey, Barbara, the intercessor, that Holy Spirit would be sent by Jesus Christ as he was poured out on the upper room and diffused the souls of mankind. Is that not phenomenal? Before Sunday, before Passover, before the good news. Remember, it took the resurrection of Christ to bring the good news. Before that, the enemy took advantage of the souls of mankind under the teachings of Christ at that time. And he was just bringing the bad news. And at that moment, in the atmosphere, you could feel the torrents of hail assailing those disciples. You could sense it. It's written in the gospel. It's written of the storms, of the shaking and the quaking in the earth. And so there was that dark hour. But understand this. Sometimes it takes the darkness to see the light. We see this in Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2 that we are to not be oppressed and distressed by our circumstances but that there is a light within our members and that light is truth and as truth rises up within us as it gives strength to our weak and frail bodies that truth is the hope of Christ inside of us and that that light pierces the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. It cannot put it out. It cannot absorb it. The darkness is unreceptive to the light. Hey, Christy Melton, I love you. I love John 1, 4, and 5 and I pray it so fervently because that scripture of John 1, 1 through 18 was so profound in one of my darkest hours in 2007 as I read it with just a whisper. And I'll never forget the power and the strength that God gave me a baptism of Holy Spirit and fire with those verses. And it says in scripture, hey Suzanne, it says about Jesus, in him was life. And that life is what the light of men. And the light shines where? In the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. It cannot put it out. It cannot absorb it. It is unreceptive to it. And we see an examination of this in Micah 7, 7 and 8. As we see the prophet unfolding his own heart. When he's in the midst of briars, of thorns... And the briars and thorns are the people that are supposed to be of God, except their fruit is being exposed, and they're a thorn to the prophet Micah. And we see in Micah 7, 7 and 8, where he talks about a God who hears. Not only a God who hears, but a God who answers. And that is what our focus is going to be on today. Because sometimes it takes a trial, a tribulation, an affliction, a thorn to get to a part of our soul that no other trial can get to. That that thorn opens up that part of our soul so that the light of truth can pierce us 
and it brings a new anointing, a fresh anointing. It brings truth. It brings the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Hey, Lisa. And so we're going to look at Micah 7, 7 and 8 as well. And scripture says in Micah 7, 8, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. For when I fall, not if I fall, okay? When I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light to me. Hey, Tammy. When we look at Micah 7, 8, we can liken it to Isaiah 60, 1 and 2. And we're going to see the potency of this. Understand that God created Adam in his image, in his likeness. And before the fall, Adam operated in such an ability of power that was resident within him that God, after the fall, caused him to not have that power, lest it be used for evil. What do I mean? It's so interesting because God had me order, as I'm still writing, halfway through, thank you, Jesus, mindfulness, the mind of Christ, God had me order watchmen knees, the latent power of the soul, and it's confirming what God has had me focused on and writing about as we're talking about the transformed mind. We're talking about the transformation of the soul into the likeness of the glory, the thoughts, the opinions of God. As those thoughts and opinions cause us to have his counsel, his knowledge, his wisdom, and we're led by Holy Spirit. Where our new spirit that has 2 Timothy 1, 7, power, love, and a sound mind knows the inheritance of resurrection. What Watchman Nee expresses about the latent power of the soul so beautifully, eloquently, as he also combines other awesome theologians that do commentary about Scripture, we see that without God, there is a power within the soul of man. However, if that power is given over to darkness then an evil spirit, an unclean spirit, will operate within that part of our soul, and we will be totally deceived and think it is God when it is not. That is why Jesus warned us of the last days in Matthew 24, if it were possible, that the elect could be deceived. And why is that? Because we see that there is a power operative that is not of God. It is not of Holy Spirit. And God is purifying us as we are buying gold refined in the fire and our eyes are being anointed so that we can see in order that we not give over to the counterfeit, in order that we not be deceived. Now think about this, saints of God. God loves us so much that he destined us to be born for such a time as this, in this time, in such a tribulation, an affliction of time, that we will know the strength of his name, holy. That we will know the strength of his name, holy. And so in this time of Passover and unleavened bread in the celebration of these feasts, we are getting to that place of purification of our heart to where any area of our heart that is given over to that latent power of our soul in our own strength is exposed. It's exposed to the light. That is why Jesus could say, that on this day, many will come and say, we have cast out devils. We have performed miracles. We have done healings. We have prophesied in your name. And he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Because there will be those that will operate in a latent power within their soul 
that is unclean. It is unholy. And they will not be discerning. Why? Because they will not have that light of truth. But the darkness that is in them, as Jesus talked about, let the light that is in you be light. Do not let the light that is in you be darkness. Today, God is going to bring such peace, shalom to your soul, as we look at the scriptures that I mentioned earlier. And we're going to, first of all, start at the scripture in Nehemiah relating to the dung gate. Because there is a dung gate. And we're going to see it with Ephesians 3.16. And the Spirit of God within our members. As God brings justice to our temple. And it looks like freedom. It looks like deliverance. Whether we realize it or not. When an unclean spirit of the enemy attaches to the members within our emotions and our minds. As Paul talks about in Romans 7, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I want to do. That is where we are right now. If you're doing things you don't want to do, thoughts that the enemy has tried to bring to your mind, you're taking them captive, amen, that you've not had before, you are in this place of consecration within your members in order that the light of truth rise in you in greater measure for good works, for good fruit. Amen. So let's look at Nehemiah. And we're going to look at Nehemiah 2.13. We're going to look at 3.13, 12.31, 3.14. And the reason that I'm bringing up all these scriptures is because I want you to see that there is a dung gate. As God had me write God's Firewall, Hell of the Soul series where I've written 24 workbooks, and I brought three of those workbooks into book form, there's going to be 12 gates of Jerusalem, and those 12 gates represent the soul of mankind, is what God had me write on in that series. And one of those gates is the dung gate. And you're going to see how the dung gate is going to express the justice of God. In delivering mankind from their present condition, their present state. And it works cooperatively with scripture as we see the combination of Ephesians 3.16 with the spirit of God's might. <clears throat> God had me write on the sevenfold dimension of Holy Spirit. Four of those books in God's Firewall School of the Prophets are brought out with two of them already being on one of two of the sevenfold dimension of Holy Spirit's spirit talked about in Isaiah 11 2 and the spirit of might is one of those God had me do each dimension of the sevenfold dimension of Holy Spirit with part of anatomy with the spirit of might I wrote it early 2012 God had me do the anatomy of the stomach and unpack scripture in truth with the anatomy of the stomach to demonstrate the facet of the spirit of might. And we're going to see the spirit of might in Ephesians 3.16. The spirit of might comes with the spirit of the Lord for deliverance, for freedom. And as we look at the dung gate, we're going to really get into, I want to say digest. And we're going to say, yes, digest, because the stomach is to digest. And we're going to see the spirit of might with that. And the operation of Holy Spirit. Because when you get ready for deliverance from areas within your soul that are still not free. <laughs> areas where truth needs to diffuse you. By the power of Holy Spirit as in the book of Acts and in that baptism that Jesus Christ came to bring of Holy Spirit and fire, Matthew 3, 11 and 12, God is going to allow tribulation in order to get to a place in your heart to open it up. And a great analogy is a seed. A seed, the sower of seed, Mark 4, 
The seed is the word. And when a seed is planted in the ground, it's a grain. And the pressure of the soil causes that grain to pop open the seed. And what's inside of the seed can come out. And that's what we see with tribulations. That there are areas in our heart where truth is planted. It is planted there. Amen. Where the seed is planted and the persecution is trying and testing us because of that word. And that pressure opens up that truth. It causes us to be receptive to light, to Holy Spirit, to the Spirit of truth. Amen. So let's look at Nehemiah 12, 13. Scripture says, I went out by night by the valley gate towards the dragon's well. Now, isn't it interesting? The dragon's well and the valley gate are near the dung gate. That is not just happenstance. Because when we're talking about a valley, it's Song of Solomon 2, 1 and 2, that she is like a rose, a flower. Hey, Renee, I love you. That grows in deep and difficult places surrounded by thorns. I went out by the night by the valley gate towards the dragon's well and to the dung gate and inspected the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. When we see the dragon gate by the dung gate, there is a connection. It is the spirit of Leviathan sending messages to your soul. Understand that the attacks of the enemy are a counterfeit of Holy Spirit. And the word of truth brings us discernment to test, amen, to test what we hear, to test what our thoughts are in order that we can discern if it's unclean, if it's clean, if it's if it's profane, if it's holy. Amen. So let's look at that valley gate and that dragon's well. In John 4, Jesus proclaims of his ability and sufficiency to give to the Samaritan woman rivers of living water. It is not Jacob's well that she is going to drink from, but it is a well of unending supply of strength, ability, power, sufficiency, and it will come through rivers of living water. So when we look at the dragon's well in Nehemiah 2, we see the dragon's well compared to the opposite of living water, and it is the water of lies. It is murkiness. And the way that I like to bring it into analogy is imagine yeast. Because at this time we are in the Feast of Unleavened Bread where the Jews go into their house. They sweep all of their house and they make sure, they're, sure there is no leaven. There is no yeast fermenting products within their house. Because what does yeast do? It causes bread to rise up. Yeast represents pride. If you look at yeast, and generally you properly prepare old-fashioned yeast, you're going to put it in water first. You're not going to put the yeast into the dough, into the flour first. You're going to put it in a cup of water, and it's almost like a lukewarm water. It's a warm water. That causes it to be activated. Now, about three weeks ago, I did a message on the church of Laodicea, and I talked about yeast and how it's activated in that kind of water, which is not hot. If the water is too hot, the yeast will not be activated. So when we look at yeast at this time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread as well, yeast represents pride or the old nature the soul's latent power to want to be God. Whether we realize it or not, that at the time of Eve and Adam's fall, and I want to say Eve because I don't want to just emphasize Adam when Eve was the one that seduced her husband, okay? And I want to bring that up. So at the time of 
mankind's fall, the power given and afforded to Adam was absolutely incredible. He had God in him, breathed in him, walked in the cool of the day, in the presence and the power of God, and walked in such authority and power in this earth. After his fall, because of the temptation to be God by the enemy, that power was cut off so that Adam would not be able to walk in a strength beyond measure, but that Adam would be utterly dependent on God to let God be God. And in our frailty, I know you hear the ambulances in the background. I live by a hospital. As you, as we see with Adam, that he would know in his weakness, he would be made strong. And it's important that we know this. And one of the things that my new book, Mindfulness, the Mind of Christ, addresses is how the counterfeit religions are operating in a power. And this power is not God. But they're seeing miracles, signs, and wonders. And we also know that Jesus tells us that there would be false signs and wonders in the end of the age. We also see it in the book of Revelation. And the reason that you're going to see that is because of that latent power in the soul given over to unclean spirits. And that is why the sifting of our soul is so important so that we're not deceived and we are holy. In order that we receive the power of Holy Spirit, Who does the will of the Father. Amen. So when we see the dung gate. It is connected to the dragon's well. And there has to be a cutting off. Of that supply. Of resource. To the person. And that dung gate is poop. In in Jerusalem. There is a poop gate. Imagine how much stench rose at that gate. So when we see the dung gate, it represents the lies of the enemy, first and foremost, that cause us to think that we are taking on the counsel of God when we're not, that causes us to give our ears over to the lies of the enemy instead of being circumspect and prudent and taking that thought captive. So let's look at Nehemiah 2, 13 again. I went out by the night, out by night, by the valley gate towards the dragon's well and to the dung gate and expected the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down. So these walls actually represent the soul. The brokenness of the soul, not by true contriteness, but instead being smited by the enemy. God is going to Romans 8, 28, work that to your good when you've been at the dung gate long enough. The dung gate represents waking up to God's justice to know that your present state is not reality, but instead there is an anointing, there is grace by Holy Spirit that is given to you from the Father in order to know truth. In order to know truth. John 16, 13. That the Spirit of truth will show us all things. That the Father has given Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit will not speak His own message, but will only speak the message of the Father. And it will always testify of Jesus Christ, the dung gate, as we see in Nehemiah 2.13, is the place where you wake up to the dragon's well that you have been drinking from in your members. Those lies that have been supplying you a counterfeit strength that you've given your ear over to, and God is allowing the shaking, the tribulation. So we will wake up 
to the dragon's well that we have been beside and realize we are sitting in stench of dong in that area of our soul and will not tolerate it anymore. But we will be violent, Matthew eleven twelve, to see, to apprehend and seize the kingdom of heaven by force. This trial that we are in these 10 days, some of you are having considerations, not that you're dwelling on them. Believe me, I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you what I hear the Father saying. And I'm giving you the warnings of a watchman. As God had me proclaim it last Tuesday and all last week speak messages of it. Hey, Liz. Hey, Mache. And as God had me speak messages, he had me warn the saints for 10 days there is going to be intense battles. Buckle up. Two days after that, three tornadoes on that Thursday, last Thursday, hit in the Birmingham metro area. One in my old neighborhood that I moved from, thank you, Jesus, six years ago in 2015, Eagle Point, it totally ripped and destroyed houses in that home. And when we look at the warfare in this hour, It is very intense. And so the dragon's well, as represented in Nehemiah 2.13, shows us the lies that are still operative within our members that we are totally clueless to, where the enemy is bringing a counterfeit strength to our person so that we yield to the circumcision of the heart Hebrews 4.12, where that sword of word of truth goes to our intents and our motives and brings deliverance. And I know a lot of people can't understand this, and I want to say that the message that I've been giving out over the last seven days, eight days now, is not for everyone. Not everyone understands this battle because they're not going through what some of us are going through. And they're going to look at us and they're going to say, well, just do this, just do that, just do this. Oh yeah, wait till they get in it, okay? And they'll be singing a whole different tune. They'll be crying out, oh God, help me. That is where we see Nehemiah. That is where we see Micah. That is where we see Hannah. Until you get to such a place of the vexation of your soul in this trying and you cry out to God to where only Holy Spirit in you can cry out, you're not going to see the deliverance. You're not going to see the power. And believe you me, I would rather not go through this. Because if I tell you what I've been through in the last three days, And I've been crying out to God. And I've been telling my husband, Rich, of the reality of where I am. And thank you, God, that God has just given him grace to uh, encourage, to endure. (laughs) Because some of the things I told him, you know, just was not pleasant. And hit him between the eyes. He was not expecting this. And he knows me. But I am being transparent with you. That there is such a deep place in your soul that the dragon's well has been a source of strength. That God is bringing deliverance in this hour where what has been unconscious to you is surging up in this trying so that you will have the strength to see the might of God prevail in the time of Christ's resurrection, the inheritance that you have been given. But how many of you know that you cannot obtain an inheritance until you know about it? You can't seize it until you know you have it. Amen. So let's look at Nehemiah 3, 13. And we're still looking at the dung gate. 
The valley gate, the main entrance in the west wall, that Jaffa gate was repaired by Hanun and the inhabitants of Zenoa. They built it up and set up its doors, its bolts, its bars, and repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the dung gate. Again, the valley gate is by the dung gate. It is not until you're in a valley, as you see in Scripture in Hosea 2.15, that there is a door of hope. People are in a valley. They just don't know it. They just don't know it. So it's the affliction that we're in right now that causes us to be awake to the valley gate so that we know the hope of Christ. Listen, saints of God, we are at a time of purification as never before, and it really was intense last year, and it's multiplying this year. There is a massive separation, and God is just separating the remnant. He is bringing the true church together because of what is happening in this earth, in this nation, in the nations, in order for his plan and purpose to manifest. Amen. And so we see, furthermore, that connection with the dung gate. Now, verse 14 of Nehemiah 3, the dung gate was repaired by Milcahai, uh, Malkahai, son of Rechab, the ruler of the district of Beth Hachem. He built it up, set its doors, its bolts, its bars. Now, in God's Firewall, Hill of the Soul series, I have every name, every name. And I pleaded with God not to let me do it, but he said I had to do it. And I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I was obedient. I have every name unpacked in Hebrew, the meaning of it in those teachings, because it brings more wisdom, knowledge, understanding about what is happening within our soul. What is being saved is our soul, Philippians 2.12. Work out your salvation in fear and in trembling. Amen. It's worked out in our soul. So we are going to stop here with the dung gate and just take a moment, a brief look at who's building it, who's repairing it, and what all is connected to the this repair, repair of the breach. Amen. The breach in what? The soul. And we're going to see the purpose of, of what it's going to bring to you to uh, and me today as it relates to truth. Because understand this, it cannot be emphasized enough. Oh my goodness, I just want to reach through the screen and get your brain and put it in my brain so you can know what I know. Where God is bringing the power of truth. When you understand and see truth in a whole different way, and you see it instead as an instrument. Now just imagine this box. Imagine that this is a special instrument. And I open it up. And it's an instrument. And it tells me all kinds of things. And I'm just like. And I can ask of this box. Box. What am I. What, what does this mean box. Box is so and so speaking truth. Imagine if we had a little box, an instrument just like this, and we carried it around with us. And all throughout the day, when anything happened, when anybody spoke to us, when any circumstance happened, all we had to do was say, okay, box, is this truth? Okay, box, what does this mean? Saints, that is what the truth by Holy Spirit does for us. We have to see it different because the soul that is fallen, that is deceived, does not see the propensity and the power of truth. It's an enigma. It's a mystery. Truth is a measuring instrument. Now, let that be an exclamation mark in your soul. Truth is a measuring instrument. And I've taught on it already in the coaching sessions where I've written about mindfulness, the mind of Christ. And I have an instrument 
revealing truth as Jesus unpacks it in parables and as the Old Testament unpacks it, you have to look at truth in a whole different way in order to get understanding about your deliverance and about the Spirit of God's might that delivers you. Hallelujah. And you have to see truth as an instrument that is not outside of you that you carry around, but you carry this inside of you. And the incredible thing is, is that it doesn't decrease the more that you're hungry and thirsty for righteousness and you drink of living waters. Instead, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Isaiah 54, enlarge the curtains of your habitation, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. Truth increases within your members and that is how you get discernment. So when we look at the dung gate, we're going to look at these names and we're going to see how Holy Spirit brings the Spirit of God's might to strengthen your inner man as you're rooted deeply, grounded securely in the love of Christ to know the deliverance of God. And it takes a vexation like Hannah in 1 Samuel 1 as she was vexed by Peninnah and she was vexed where? At the place of worship. So the enemy, like the dragon's well, is vexing parts of your soul. What parts? That have not obtained and understood truth. God is allowing it in this warfare so that freedom comes. Amen, Renee. Deliverance comes. Amen, Debbie. So let's look at these names, amen. With the dung gate, we see Melchiah, and we see he's the son of Rahab, the ruler of the part of Beth Hacharim. Hacharim. So let's look at these names, amen. Amen, Suzanne. This name, the name of the man who repaired it, <clears throat> comes from King appointed by Yah. King appointed by Yah. Now get this, saints of God. This is that royal priesthood, that holy nation, that chosen generation where we are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a holy nation. First Peter 2, 9. It's this place that we're getting delivered in our soul. That that which is unclean, the dragon's well, that has been speaking to us, is now not being tolerated because its stench stinks. We know that something is rotten. It's like rotten eggs. And we're awake to it. We're aware of it. We're conscious of it. So as it relates to the anatomy of the stomach with the spirit of might, and I've been talking about within the subconscious, is we have the ability, the grace afforded to us by God to digest it, to process it. Where I've even been reading in my book, Clawing and Gnawing, editing it, as I talked about in this past weekend's meeting in Missouri, just being transparent and as I'm editing those first 10 pages of Clawing and Gnawing, and I'm seeing the main character, Millie, and it's written autobiographical. I'm writing myself. Millie is Robin. And I'm saying Millie was bullied. Millie felt schizophrenic. Millie had voices degrading her. And I wrote it, and I didn't think anything about it. And I was like, yes, this is good. I know it's me. But in editing it two years later, and looking at it, it totally hit me a different way. And there was a different part of my soul that was able to receive grace. And God spoke to me gently. And he said, Robin, do you not see that that is you? That you're still in some area of your soul, you're still intimidated. You're still bullied. And there's still a part of you that has to receive truth and the power of my love that God will never leave us nor forsake us. 
and that he is love and that perfect love drives out fear and so when we see that this repairer at the dung gate that that repairer's name Milcaha, let me just make sure i pronounce this right his name correctly Malkia means king appointed by Yah. That represents authority. That we are now walking not in the authority of our soul, nor as things that we have perceived, whether we realize it or not, that we have been playing God, but now we are walking in the power of God's spirit, in his might. It is not by our power, it is not by our might, but it is by his spirit. Amen. So let's look at who he's the son of. He's the son of Rechab. Rechab means rider. So he's the king appointed by Yah. And he is a rider. And I think about running with horses in Jeremiah 12, 5. Where we have to see what's happening with Jeremiah. When you understand what is really happening with Jeremiah... That whole chapter is about Jeremiah's persecution, the persecution of his soul. And he is just griping and complaining about the persecution he's been enduring by the stares of others who call themselves of God, but they persecute him. And it is just really affecting his soul. He's at the dung gate. He's in the valley. And he is having a pity party. And then God chastises him and he says to the prophet, if you can't run with men, how are you going to contend with horses? In other words, there's demonic powers that are operative, that strength by Holy Spirit is going to give us grace in this hour, that the trial that is to come on this whole earth of uh, Revelation 3.10 that we are going to be protected in the time of riding with horses and that jungled maze in Jeremiah 12, 5, chaos. So God is preparing us. There is going to be more chaos to come upon the earth. But we in Christ Jesus, because we're being set free, we will not be tossed to and fro, hallelujah, but we will be established in the strength of the name of the Lord to do his marvelous works. He is going to show himself strong and mighty. And we are going to be those, as depicted in Daniel, that will do great exploits, saints of God. So let's look at also the place in which was mentioned, the place in which was mentioned of Melchiel from the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of Beth Hasarim. That name, let me make sure I'm pronouncing it right. Beth Hakeem is what, and that, that C, that double C is not pronounced S, like I thought was Semech. It's not. It's a Chet, a Chet, it looks like. So it's Beth Hacharem, and it means the house of the vineyard. House of the vineyard. When we are looking at the dung gate, God is opening our eyes so that we know the vineyard. He's called us to the souls that are to come to the kingdom where we are laborers forced out into the fields of harvest to bring them in. Amen. Let, therefore, let us go to Micah, because I know we're pressed for time. Let us go to Micah 7, 7 and 8. Micah 7, 7 and 8. Because God really wants to bring us uh, encouragement, exhortation, life abundantly, so that we can be encouraged and exhorted with rivers of living water. One of the things, as we look at the dragon's well with the dung gate, we see that spirit of Leviathan, the counterfeit of Leviathan to Holy Spirit. The counterfeit of it is to send messages. And the messages are going to barrage your mind. As, uh, Isaiah 59, 10, when the enemy comes in like a flood. And so that flood represents the messages 
of Satan. We also see Paul go through this in 2 Corinthians 12 as he boasts of his infirmity and talks about a messenger of Satan sent to buffet his flesh. That is where we are. And it is vexing us. And if it wasn't vexing you, I would be worried, okay? The fact that it's vexing you is evidence that Leviathan, that messenger of Satan that sin against you like a thorn, that he's being exposed. And this is where we see Psalm 74, 13 and 14, where God takes a sword of the Lord and he cuts all the heads of the dragons all of the dragon off and he cuts up Leviathan in the wilderness and feeds him to the creatures of the wilderness. In other words, the enemy like Goliath, like the giants as revealed in Numbers 13, they become your bread. You devour them. You destroy them by receiving the anointing. The anointing swells up and breaks, destroys the yoke of oppression. Amen. So let's look at Micah 7, 7 and 8. And then I'm just going to say a couple more things and then we'll end today's broadcast. Scripture says, but as for me, and this is where we're going to have a firm confidence that in this time, like Micah was vexed, like Hannah was vexed, we're going to turn our eyes upward for where, from where our deliverance draws nigh. Amen. Micah 7, 7. But as for me, I will look to the Lord and confident in him, I will keep watch. So what are we doing in this 10 days? We're turning our eyes upward and we're keeping watch. We're watchmen. Where are we watching from? Upward. We're looking to God. Amen. I will wait with hope and expectancy for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And this is the working out, the exposing of the dragon's well, of the stench of the dung gate in an area of your soul that you have tolerated up to now. And God says, this is not your life. This is your life, the land of the living. Not the wilderness, not the place of bondage, not the place of trying and affliction and tribulation continually, but you're coming out of the wilderness and you're coming to the land of promise. You're coming to the land of the living. This whole process is to wake us up like Hannah, which means grace, and to cause us to turn upward and to pray to God. Because now we have knowledge. We have consciousness, awareness of what we have yielded that area of our soul to and we have partaken of and has been a source of strength in whatever form it looks like. Maybe it was a defense mechanism that we operated in and that defense mechanism is not holy. It's unholy and God is waking us up to that in a different way. And what I love about Penina that vexed Hannah is it means two things in Hebrew. It means pearl and it means to look at from a different angle. So God taught me that that affliction is to cause us to look at things from a different angle, a different mindset, being open to truth where we see the pearl of great price. Amen. Verse 8. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy, for when I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light to me. And this is where Ephesians 3.16 comes in. That we are strengthened in our inner man by the Spirit of God's might. Because at this juncture, we have tolerated a stench within our members that we are not even, a, we have not been aware of in great measure. But now God is making it so obvious that it seems insane. It seems crazy that if you would tell people, they would absolutely think you're crazy. 
And all of these insane assaults have been allowed in order that we see how truly chaotic the jungle maze we are in right now. Jeremiah 12, 5, where we have to ride with horses. Do you not think or recognize that the chaos we are experiencing in these 10 days do you not realize it is all over the world, but most are asleep to it. God has brought you and I to a juncture that we are waking up because we're not going to pull on the strength of our past defense mechanisms that are the result of the dragon's well and the dung gate that have constantly spoken within our members so that we do not accept this as our life, but instead we break through a barrier. Hallelujah. We go, and this is where we're going to end, with Micah 2, when we see Jesus is the breaker. Where truth, Jesus, the breaker who is truth, comes within your members and what you discerned before with your instrument of truth, now you see clearly. And it's experienced within your entire temple. It's not just a thought. It's a belief. It's an experienced, an emotional thought. That is belief. That is persuasion. So now let's go to Micah, Micah 2, and this is where we're going to end. And acknowledge and recognize that Micah 7, 7, and 8 go with Micah 2 as well. <clears throat> because it's that awareness of vexation that Micah the prophet has gotten to that causes him to acknowledge and discern truth where he now sees. Hey, these are briars. These are thorns. <laughs> I need to be with the right tribe. <laughs> The people of God, the royal priesthood, the holy nation. Because, saints of God, there is truly a separation. There is truly a dividing in the house of God. Because God is about to get us to a place of the harvest more than we have ever known. And he's preparing us. Amen. So, Micah 2, as we end here, we're going to look at Jesus as the breaker. Micah 2, 12 and 13. And this is where we are that place of gathering. And so if you can just imagine right here that verse 12, and it's funny that it's verse 12. Micah 2, 12 can be likened to Jeremiah 12, 5, to where God is gathering Jeremiah to the place of riding with horses. Riding with horses, saints of God. And that is where you and I are where we are going to ride through troops and leap over walls. And in the healing of the soul, when I do love and that gate on love, God has me compare it to a horse because love leaps. It leaps within your members. The love of God, the love of Christ in you, it leaps. This is where we're going to end. Micah 2, 12 and 13. Amen. And understand that the chaos, the tribulation, the affliction that you're experiencing is to get you to the place to know the love of God that drives out all fear, 1 John 4, 18, and it leaps within your members and that the truth of that love increases. Amen. Verse 12 of Micah 2, I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob. I will surely collect the remnant of Israel. I will bring them Israel like sheep in a fold, like a flock in the midst of a pasture. They, the fold and the pasture, they shall swarm woo, with men and they will hum with much noise. What is this? Holy Spirit. That swarming and that humming is much noise. And I just see horses running around in circles. And if you've ever seen the kingdom of heaven, 
and that scene of horses just running around in circles. It's so powerful. So we're going to look at a couple of words in Micah 2. God really wants us to get to this in order to get an understanding of this truth, amen, so that we see the anointing of grace given to us where the remnant of Israel gets together as the sheep of Bozrah, I love that, as the flock in the midst of their fold. He's going to be in the flock as in the midst of their fold. And they shall make great noise. Now, this is the Hebrew word we're going to look at. And then we'll look at the last word, the last scripture. It's whom, almost like hum, but whom in Hebrew. And it means an uproar. It means agitate greatly. It means destroy, move, make noise, put, ring again. It's composed of hey, vav, mem, which forms the ancient Hebrew word picture of revealing the massive flooding that's been added unto you. What flooding is that? Rivers of living water where you are now restored in the joy of your salvation and what God's done in delivering you, hallelujah, that that is stirring up in your members at the dung gate. And no more are you drinking from the dragon's well, but there is a stirring of might, of rivers of living water within your person that you are not going to tolerate the dung of Satan, the vexation of his lies to keep you in your present condition so that you break through. And understand, saints of God, we're not going one by one. In Micah 2, 12, we are going as a tribe, a nation. We're going as the remnant into this breakthrough. Amen. So let's look at the last verse. Micah 2, 13. The breaker, the Messiah, will go up before them. He's already done that. Through what? Resurrection power. Your inheritance. Amen. They will break through. They will pass in through the gate. Hallelujah. And they will go through it. And their king will pass on before them the Lord who is the head. Saints of God, you hold on. There is a power of truth that is about to be revealed within your members of Jesus Christ, the Word of God, the Son of God, that is going to be revealed within your members as the scales, the weight, the instrument, the measuring device of truth within you says, this is not my portion. And that truth measures out more and the light of that truth comes in your heart, floods the eyes of your heart with light, and you acknowledge and experience that truth in your members inside of you that says, deliverance is nigh. This is where we are, saints of God. This is why it is so exciting, and we need to be encouraged. Amen. So if you're going through the trials, be exceedingly glad. Rejoice. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Be exceedingly glad. Rejoice that your faith is coming forth as gold. I pray that the spirit of truth by Holy Spirit, John 16, 13, be upon your members, your heart, and your mind as you consecrate your body as holy as unto God, which is your reasonable worship. And that you're not conformed to this world, but you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that whatever you have tolerated of the dragon's well, of the Satan's lies, and of the stench of his profanity against truth, against God, against Jesus, is exposed to the light. And as you have been oppressed and distressed, I pray Isaiah 60 verse 1 and 2 over you. Rise up from the place of prostration and depression and oppression in which circumstances have kept you. 
rise up for your light truth has come arise and shine for the glory of God his knowledge his wisdom his understanding his thoughts his intentions have risen upon you and God will draw nations to the brightness of that rising in Jesus name amen and amen God bless you I love you and I will see you later remember Friday bring communion elements